when the church says the Holy Spirit is still alive, well, and moving. Because you have purpose, you have destiny, you have a calling in your life, and there's no brokenness that's going to hinder your potential. I wish I had a witness. The gospel is not only words, but Paul says that the gospel is power. That once you come to Christ, that question is settled. You are a son of God. And so we're talking about the promise, which is the person of the Holy Spirit, which was promised to the prophets and the ancient ones, the person of the Holy Spirit, and of course, promised by Jesus of Nazareth to the disciples. He told them, wait there in Jerusalem until you receive the promise. Say with me, the promise. About four and a half years ago, maybe five, a friend of mine, Pastor Jim Simbola at uh, Brooklyn Tabernacle Church was preaching, and he did a series on the Holy Spirit. Who wants to know what the title that Pastor Jim used? Who would like to know the title that Pastor Jim used? Anybody want to know the title? The name of the series was The Forgotten One. I said, well, that's an interesting title, Jim. The reason he called it The Forgotten One is because he says that most Christians in modern United States talk about the Father and talk about the Son, but they forget the Holy Spirit. So they're not really Trinitarian. <laughs> and so one of the gifts, I'll come over here, one of the gifts that the Pentecostal church brings to global Christianity is that they remind them that the Holy Spirit is alive and well. They remind the global church that the Holy Spirit is. Not only is the Holy Spirit alive and well, the Holy Spirit is not a force, is not a strength. The Holy Spirit is a person moving in cities, in lives, above systems, in systems, around systems, through systems. And so one of the gifts the Pentecostal church gives to the global church is to remind the rest of the body of Christ that the Holy Spirit is alive and well. And let me add this third thing, working. The Holy Spirit is alive, he's well, and he's working. And contrary to Frederick Nietzsche's prediction in the mid-1900s, God is not dead. I thank you for your enthusiasm about the life of God. I've been reading, because that is my addiction, I've been reading Hannah Arant's book, The Life of the Mind. I, meant, I have such a good wife. Let me just put that in parentheses. I, have, I, I was reading some notes about the life of the mind, and I mentioned it in passing. I just mentioned it in passing. I said, wow, I want to read this book, The Life of the Mind. In two days, I had it delivered from Amazon. I didn't ask for it. I didn't require it. She just heard my capricious whim and she ordered it. I want to thank God for a wife. Okay, I'll, I'll, uh, some of you don't have, Mother's Day is next week. I just want to put out there that, okay, all right. No es ayuda demonia, es ayuda idonia. I don't even translate in English. Just let the spirit work with you. And so let me talk to you something I, that I've been, that has been in my heart that I've been sharing with my, with my boss, Pastor Nino. Yeah, and, I, and I've been saying, and Pastor Nino, I'm excited. Say with me, I'm excited for what God is doing and what God is going to do. And so we have this phrase. I, I am letting you into the Wednesday meeting of the pastoral table. Who would like a sneak peek right now? Who would just like to sneak into the pastoral table? Just a sneak peek. We have a phrase every Wednesday that we want to make yours. We are building a great city. I'll come over here. We are building a great city uh, uh, whose chief architect is God and whose light is Jesus. And so we're building a great city. And, and Pentecost, as we approach Pentecost, it shows us certain dimensions. Say with me, dimensions. Certain dimensions of the life of the Spirit. And so last week I spoke about how the Holy Spirit helps the life of the mind in what? In its thinking, in its willing, and in its judging. How you think, 
how you will things, your willpower, and how you discern things, how you judge between good and bad, the life of the mind. The mind is a terrible thing to waste, and many people waste it. And so the Holy Spirit, whom Paul says in Romans, the 12th chapter, regenerates the mind. I like that. He gives it a new mind. He renews the mind. Later, he says that you and I have the mind of Christ. And we've been given the mind of Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the mind, because it is fallen, just like every other dimension of human life is fallen, it sometimes thinks wrongly, wills wrongly, and judges wrongly. And thank God for the Holy Spirit who helps us to think, to will, and judge rightly. And so I was talking about that personal dimension. Say with me, personal dimension. Those personal dimensions of the Holy Spirit. Most times when we preach in the church, most times when we preach in the church, we talk about the personal dimensions of the Holy Spirit. What does he mean for me? What does he do for me? How he forms my character. How the Holy Spirit forms my thinking. How he forms my behavior. How he makes me more like Christ. But I'm here to tell you that the Holy Spirit has an inner wheel and an outer wheel. The Holy Spirit has an inner wheel and an outer wheel. Ezekiel called this a gyroscope when he saw the vision of God and, the, and God leaving the temple. He talked about a wheel inside of a wheel. And it has an inner wheel. Say with me, the inner wheel. The dimensions, the personal dimensions. But it has an outer wheel in that it changes systems. The Holy Spirit changes systems, changes cities. And so when, when, when Sister Lisette and Brother William were talking about going to Ecuador... And that their 14-year-old their teenage daughter said, don't use me as an excuse. Well, I was like, and then, and then she said something that would have got me slapped if I was 14 years old. She says, don't let your materialism hold you captive to God's destiny in your life. I submit to you for your acceptance or rejection, that the Holy Spirit was speaking through that teenager. Because the Holy Spirit has plans for Ecuador. Allow me to dare to say that in the midst of crisis and sin, where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. In Spanish, it's a better translation. Where sin pushes, grace pushes the stronger. Donde abunda el pecado, sobrepuja la gracia. And so you're in Acts chapter 3. I want to talk to you about the power of the Holy Spirit to change cities. Say with me, to change cities. And these, these are proofs. These are not an inexhaustible list. This is not the only proofs. I'm just going to give you a, proof, a list of proofs this Sunday. And if you're here at Tuesday at 7 for our midweek, we'll continue that. I want to talk to you about proofs of the presence of the Holy Spirit. Look at Acts 3. This is the first miracle after Pentecost. This is the first miracle after Pentecost. So it's emblematic. This first miracle is God setting the stage for what he's going to do after Pentecost. When it's the first miracle, just like Jesus' first miracle in John chapter 2 at the wedding at Cana of Galilee, set the standard that Jesus was going to heal family and relationships this first miracle shows you something about the Holy Spirit's agenda. Say with me, the Holy Spirit has an agenda. The Holy Spirit is not just going around. You know, some people interpret the Holy Spirit that, oh, wherever, yo, there's nothing. No, the Holy Spirit has an agenda. The Holy Spirit has purpose. The Holy Spirit has direction. The Holy Spirit is not just a wind blowing here and there. It has direction. The power of the Holy Spirit has direction. He has direction. Are you with me in Acts 3? And so if this is the first miracle post-Pentecost, it's going to teach us something about the rest of the book of Acts. It's going to teach us something about the agenda of the Holy Spirit for the new movement called the church. So let's see what we can learn from the first miracle post-Pentecost. Read with me because faith doesn't come by reading. It comes by hearing. We're reading from the New International Version, verses 1 to 10. Read with me. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer. It was about three in the afternoon. Say with me, prayer and Pentecost are always married. The antecedent to Pentecost is always prayer. Look at me. The antecedent 
to Pentecost is always prayer. They were there waiting. And the Bible says they were all together in one accord and they were praying. Prayer is always the antecedent to Pentecost. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. And then Peter said, this is my favorite phrase when I preach, look at us. So the man gave him them his full attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have. But what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up. It's interesting. Some people just like to say things, but they don't like to do the work. No, Pentecost plower is not name it and claim it, blab it and grab it. That's facile. That's easy. Not only is it bad theology, it hurts nations and cities because we have to put action to what we say. First, you say walk, and if they're not doing it, you help them up. Take him by the right hand. He helped him up, and instantly, the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. And then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. Walking jumping this guy was latino and <laughs> in some service he'd be like can you please sit down and this is disrupting and praising god they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called beautiful and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to him listen to me i want to tell you that orlando and the nearby cities are by the gate called beautiful. They're waiting for something to happen. But I want to tell you that tragic things can happen in beautiful places. Tragic things can happen in beautiful places. And so this man is not only handicapped. He is not only limited in his physical ability. He is also impoverished. How do we know he's poor? How do we know the man is poor? How do we know the man is poor? We know the man is poor because the Bible tells us he was begging. Begging every day. And so what they had in the gate called beautiful was a system of compassion. There was a compassionate system. There was a food pantry. I am, of course, being anachronistic. I'm trying to say something uh, that was not there, but compare it to our time. They had a food pantry. How do we know? Or they had an alms ministry. They gave by the temple, beautiful. He was there by the temple gate. I, I wonder why they never brought him inside. Why did they not bring the man inside? Why didn't they, it's not because of the synagogue. Is, is it because nothing broken can ever enter into the temple? Is it because of some Jewish law in Torah that the man could not come inside? I submit to you that you will never change a city wholesale till you bring the broken inside. <laughs> Proof of the presence of the Holy Spirit is that you bring broken people inside. Some people don't want to worship with broken people. The Lord saved you. He cleaned you, you. You have a good job. You have a good career. You dress nice on Sunday. But if somebody broken with some challenges, whether they're physical, whether they're economic, whether they're educational, they sit next to you, you get uncomfortable. But what you don't know is that God is sitting them next to you because they're the miracle. They're, you are the miracle they're waiting for. Tell your neighbor the proof of presence is bringing them inside. A church that leaves people outside the gates has not understood that the Holy Spirit is for the sons and the daughters, the older and the younger, for the men and the women. Tell with me, bring them inside. And so for years, 
He lived on the margins of whatever was left over instead of the overflow of what was inside. And so many people come and they look and they look at our churches and they look at our temples and they say, oh my, I wonder what's going on in there. And we pass them by. We might give them an offering. We might give them a nod. We might say, man, you look good. I hope someday you come inside. Well, don't invite them inside if you have to carry them. If you have to say, I will be the bridge that you cross over to come inside because proof of the presence of the Holy Spirit is to bring broken people inside. And so... He's there probably for many years. The Bible says that he was lame from birth. He carried this. Maybe it was a congenital problem. Maybe it was a disease that he inherited. We don't know, but all we know is that for years they gave him compassion, but not transformation. A church that gives compassion is only doing half the work of the Holy Spirit. It is not to, enough to give people compassion. You need to give them transformation. Compassion is the entryway into transformation. It's the door. It lets people see the love of God and the mercy of God. But once you're done with compassion, when you come into a city, you're not just there to give them compassion. You're there to give them transformation. The Holy Spirit comes to transform. So they're giving him alms. They're giving him bread. They're giving him all, except the very thing that he needs, the capacity to walk for himself. So yesterday... Well, Friday, I was doing a science project with my oldest son. It was a water vapor project. I didn't know this. I learned this. You know, you ever see that show, Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? Anybody ever see that? Any of you not smarter than a fifth grader like me? Right. The reason you fail is because the stuff that you're taking there, you haven't done in 20 years. And they just took it last week. So they remember it. The project is called a water vapor project. What Water Vapor Project is, is they take a piece of paper called cobalt chloride. It's a cobalt chloride paper. It's blue. The paper's blue. You put it on a piece of paper. The capacity of that paper is to be able to detect when water is in the air. It's able to detect when there's water in the air. And so whenever there's humidity, if you put it outside, you will see that the paper starts turning from blue to pink. And the more water in the air, the pinker it becomes. I submit to you that the church needs to become cobalt chloride. And stop being so blue. <laughs> and the city, the neighborhood, your school, wherever you work, your marriage, your children, the court system needs to be able to say, we detect that there's water in the air. And we're turning from blue to pink. The church is the detector that there's water in the air. I submit to you, of course, that you know that water is a metaphor for the presence of the Holy Spirit. There shall come one after me that baptizes with the Holy Spirit with fire, but he's also a river of living waters. Tell your neighbor, we got to change colors. And so the, word, the church is the litmus test, is the cobalt chloride that's saying there's water in the air. While the church is blue, the nations will continue down precipice. But when the church says the Holy Spirit is still alive, well, and moving. So he looks at him. Looks at us. Pro, it says that when you look at persons, you look them in the eye. Of course, in some cultures, it is disrespectful to look at people in the eye. It's a cultural interest. It's an interesting cultural idiosyncrasy. If you have a biracial couple, kids are thoroughly confused. Because the Anglo is like, look at me when I'm talking to you. And the Latina is, no me mire cuando te estoy hablando. Don't look at me when I'm talking to you. So if you have a Puerto Rican mom and an Anglo dad, you better work that out early. Because for an Anglo to look him in the eye is to respect him. But to look a Latino in the eye is to disrespect him. So the kid's going to be like. Don't be looking at me. Don't eyeball me. But in the ancient world, to look at somebody in the eye is to tell him you have dignity. You have purpose. God has made you beautiful. You are the imago Dei, the image of God. The Bible says most times in the ancient world, the people they didn't look in the eye were the sick people, the prostitutes, the lepers, and the people on the side of the road. It's interesting that every miracle that you see, Jesus looks directly at people. Now look at me. 
we have a problem. Say, ask me, Pastor, what's the problem? Uh, we have a problem. Ask me, Pastor, what's the problem? The church has stopped looking people in the eye. But a church filled with the Holy Spirit, a proof of presence is that we look people in the eye and we say, no matter what you've gone through, no matter what system has failed you, no matter who's abandoned you, we look you in the eye because you have purpose, you have destiny, you have a calling in your life, and there's no brokenness that's going to hinder your potential. I wish I had a witness in this house this morning. Touch three people and say, look them in the eye. We got court systems that think they're going to intimidate us. I'm not even here. I'll come over here. We have court systems that think they're going to look us, they're going to intimidate us. I want you to tell the, the church and tell the world, the world is coming of age because we have the power of the Holy Spirit and we're going to look the court system right in the eye. Do not confuse humility with slavery. How you doing? I'm all right. We, I'm just humble. I'm humble. You're not humble. There's a difference. Humility is recognizing that everything you have was a gift from God. Slavery is I have nothing. I hear people preach it. I'm just a filthy rag of unrighteousness. No, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says in your former life you were filthy rags of unrighteousness, but now you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You're the head and not the tail. You're above and not below. When the Holy Spirit comes, he gives us the power to look at systems. Touch two neighbors and say, look them in the eye. The educational system, look them in the eye. The financial system, look them in the eye. The business system, look them in the eye. Look at us. We're not ashamed of who we are. Middle afternoon, we just came from prayer. We have something that everybody doesn't have. The story is told that St. Thomas Aquinas went to a worship sanctuary, and he sat there. And the bishop of that cathedral, after the service, asked him to come back to, to the back office. When he comes back into the office, they're counting the money. And the bishop says to St. Thomas Aquinas, Tom, the church can no longer say we don't have gold or silver. Tom got indignant. He says, and neither can we say, take up your bed and walk. Because we have the money, but we don't have the power. Let me tell you what Pentecost does. The first miracle of Pentecost takes on two giants, poverty and illness. He's taking on two giants. The very first miracle is telling the world the church is not here to play around. We're going to take on poverty and we're going to take on illness. Two great giants. The Holy Spirit is setting the agenda for the power of the church. It, it's not just a prayer meeting. It's a healing service. And it's an economic restructuring service. In that first Pentecost post miracle, there's prayer, which talks about the devotional life. There's miracle, which talks about the supernatural life. And there's financial uplifting, which talks about the social life. The Holy Spirit was not there for them to have a fun Sunday service. The Holy Spirit was there to turn the whole world upside down. Tell your neighbor, Pentecost power. Pentecost power changes poverty and changes disease. We don't have silver. We don't have gold. But what we do have, we don't charge you for it. Can I talk to you? Can pastor talk to you? Can we do some theological education real quick, fast, and in a hurry? If people are making money off the backs of the poor and using the Holy Spirit, it is not the Holy It's another spirit, but it's not the Holy Spirit. What we have, not we, not what we have, we rent to you. Not what we have, we sell to you. What we have, we give to you. The Bible says, cast your bread upon the waters. After many days, it will return to you. 
Because proof of the presence of the Holy Spirit is not just supernatural miracles and economic restructuring. It's generosity. People filled with the Holy Spirit are generous. I give it all away so you can use me. Take my heart, not my wallet. I give it all away. You know the Holy Spirit has come into the innermost recondite parts of your being because you're generous with your time. You're generous with your talent. You're generous with your treasure. The Holy Spirit makes us generous people. They had all things in common and gave all things away so that the vulnerable and the poor would have enough. If you're jumping up and down, but you're not changing structures, you're having a good event, but you're not part of a movement. And God is not inviting you to a moment. He's inviting you to a movement. God is not inviting you to a Sunday gathering. In Sunday, we celebrate what God is doing Monday through Saturday. Sunday's the celebration, but the work of the church is happening all week long. I, I, I like that. It. it was Monday morning, and they were at 3 o'clock in the afternoon praying. So let me talk about three things that, that there's proof of presence. Number one, it changes social structures. It changes them. The Holy Spirit is not here to play around. He's here to take over. You know why? Because in the time, I love the church. I love somebody else. Is anybody else enamored with the church? You know what I love about the church? They grow in a most difficult time. Roman Empire. Oppression. And everybody was looking at Rome to solve their problems. And instead of being getting better, they got worse. And Rome would steal from people. Rome would kill people. Rome would crucify people upside down and right side up. Rome would torture people. Rome would steal from nations. And when the church comes, everybody's like, mm, let's see how this is different. How is this different? When you joined the church, you joined the most radical community in the world. When God called you and made part of this body, he didn't, you didn't join just to sing hallelujah and praise the Lord and have a good time on Sunday. You joined a movement. And you're part of that movement. And that movement changes structures, addresses poverty, addresses disease, addresses marginalization. And that fourth thing is addresses is ineffective, ineffective religiosity. This guy was by religion his whole life. I'm concerned that what we have is dead churchianity instead of living Christianity. And so people come to church and they don't experience God. They get their one and a half hour fix and don't go over one and a half hours because I got things to do. And God wants to radically turn their world upside down. And we commodify what we do instead of saying, if you knew what was coming and you knew the power that God had to change your family, to change your marriage, to change your children, you would say, silver and gold I don't have, but what they have here, give me some of that. And so the Holy Spirit addresses poverty, addresses disease, and addresses inefficacious religiosity. Listen to me. I am a student of the church. In the 1970s, there were great revivals in New York City. Great revivals in the 60s and the 70s. I know my father, my grandparents, they were part of those great movements. It was one of the most evangelized cities in North America. There's a book by Elding Villafaña that speaks about the movement of Pentecostalism and Christianity in the Northeast from New York to Allentown. What happened from the 60s to the year 2000 that now they're the most secular city in the, in the country? Not true. Portland is the most secular city, the second most secular city in the country. What happened? Why didn't it stick? It didn't stick because we changed the movement for a moment. We changed the power for money. We changed influence for affluence. Let me be clear. God is not against your affluence. He lifts this man up. He lifts him up economically. The problem is that the reason God blesses you is to bless others. If you're blessed, it's to bless others. I assure you that the more you give, the more God gives you. I don't know how this works. I don't know how it works, but I've seen it work. Look, look. The Holy Spirit comes. 
brings him inside, looks him in the eye and gives him dignity, heals him. He does three things. He starts walking. Say with me, walking. Because when the Holy Spirit comes, he changes your lifestyle. Say with me, lifestyle. That means you're not one person on Sunday and another person on Monday. That means actually your lifestyle, the way you think and the way you act towards other people and the way you speak and the way you treat your children and the way you treat your friends. Oh, and by the way, the way you treat your enemies. You know what's radically hard about Christianity? Matthew 5. Love your enemies. Not like them, love them, hug them, buy them some cake. Every time I read that about Jesus, I'm like, yes, Jesus, but you, do you know Pepe? I really just, could I take Pepe off that list? Does anybody have a Pepe they don't want on the love list? If that's the guy or the woman on your list, that's the Holy Spirit telling you, no, 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 no. When I came in, I challenged even your lifestyle. We got Christians using the language of secular culture. Bomb them, kill them. Excuse me. Pardon moi, you serve the Prince of Peace. The Holy Spirit comes, he changes your walk. If you had a violent walk, now it's a peace walk. If you had a hostile walk, now it is an amicable walk. If you had a walk that cursed everything and saw everything negatively, now you have a positive, hope-filled walk. Say your name, tell your neighbor, the Holy Spirit comes, he changes your walk. How many need a walk change this year? The second thing is, he was jumping. So he doesn't just change your walk, he changes your expectation. I know so many people who are, who are contaminated with the disease of the 21st century, which is pessimism. Cynicism. The disease of the 21st century is things can't get better. I, even preachers. Things are going to get worse. I'm like, I'm sorry, is the Holy Spirit still here? No, because things got to get worse. Before Jesus come, everything. That's not what the Bible says, y'all. It says there'll be wars and rumors of war. By the way, there's been wars and rumors of war since the times of Christ. But the church has always flourished in the midst of that thing. Stop using the language of secular society of pessimism. God is still in his throne. All of Orlando could have a financial meltdown, but that's world economy. I have for you word economy. And we're going to be the resource that Orlando needs to save the city. I am, oh. Tell your neighbor, we're building a great city. Touch turn people and say, we're building a great city. And negative people can't build cities. So I'm jumping. People are like, why are you so happy? You're living in boxes. I say, yeah, but you don't know my tomorrow. My grandmother used to say, y'all know my grandma, right? Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know. He holds my future. And we're walking around talking like God doesn't have the future in his hands. You're only afraid if you don't know who holds your destiny. He was jumping. If he was Puerto Rican, bailando en una pata. Hey, what's your lifestyle? Is it jumping or is it like this? How you doing? I'm all right. How are you? I Straight out of a Tim Conway sitcom. I'm a coming. I'm a com if you're young, you have no idea what I'm talking about. You got to be 35 and older. I'm a coming. I'm a coming. Google it. Tim Conway, Carol Burnett. Okay. And why are you living that way? If the Holy Spirit has come to change our city upside down. To give you the power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing by any means shall hurt you. What are you afraid of? If God be for us. 
Touch your neighbor and say, the Holy Spirit fills us with expectation. You've got to be excited. I'm so excited. I just can't hide it. I'm about to lose control, and I think I like it. Pop cultural reference number two. And your children see you negative. You know, in some of our cultures, we, we, we transmit fear to people. Cuidado. Every other word is cuidado. Y'all don't know cuidado in English? Be careful. And then we invent things that don't exist. El cuco. Why are you inventing things that don't exist to scare future generations? Cuidado que el cuco. Who, who gave you the authority for psychological terrorism and spiritual terrorism over future generations? The Holy Spirit has come to set people free. We don't have gold. We don't have silver. But there's one thing we have. The problem, the challenge, and the authority of proclamation and uplifting. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, tell Orlando, stand up. Ah, yes, our sports teams are going to be changed. Our business is going to be changed. Downtown Orlando is going to be changed because there's a Paul, there's a Peter, there's a John, there's a Mary that says, I say to you, Orlando, stand up. <laughs> Courage is in high demand and low supply. Courage. C -c -c Courage. Said Dorothy to the lion from the Wizard of Oz. No, I get that cuidado, you afraid. Who told you to be afraid? Who taught you this thing? You have the Holy Spirit above you, around you, and inside you. Look at me, look at me. Ask me, Pastor, what's the most repeated phrase in Scripture? Look at me, ask me, Pastor, what's the most repeated phrase? In scripture, fear not. 365 times, one for every day of the year. So when you get up in the morning, look in the mirror and say, fear not. You have one for every day of the year. The Holy Spirit is, a, is on the church and is working through the church. But the church has to take that authority and say, we're going to come jumping. When I come to church, I come excited. I come singing in my car. And y'all know I can sing. Don't laugh at your pastor right in his face. I can sing. You know why I sing so much? Because I have so many other sounds trying to scare me. Anybody? So many other noises in the city, in the culture. So I sing so my kids can hear it. And then my wife's like, she helps me. You know, she helps me. Jumping. First is lifestyle, then is attitude and expectation. God changes your expectation. What do you expect from the future of this city? What do you expect from the future? All I know is that I was lame and now I can jump. And thirdly, praising God. It changes your focus. Your inner life, your devotion. Because if you're able to walk and jump and change the economic system of the city and the religious inefficacy, you remember that it wasn't you. Worship reminds the human being that anything they have came from God. Worship puts everything in its proper priorities. Look at me. The Hebrews, the Jews, wear a yarmulke, yes? Why? The yarmulke is a physical reminder that they're on earth and God is in heaven. It is a physical reminder that God is above and they are below. It is a physical reminder that there is a God in heaven who knows their name. Yarmulke is the physical symbol of covenant and relationship and order. And so worship, listen, if you have a worship deficit in your life, it's because... The presence of the Holy Spirit has not inundated every dimension of your life because the Holy Spirit always leads people to worship Christ. If your jargon, your language at home is fighting, arguing, cursing, God is here to change 
your language. But you can only change your language when your walk and your expectation has changed. I've been here four months yesterday. Thank you for your, thanks for love. I have a phrase that I tell Pastor Jonathan every week. He looks at me, he says, he says, Pastor, tell me, tell me. He says, I said, we're not here to play around. Pinky. What are we going to do today? The same thing we do every day. Plan to take over the world. It seems ambitious, doesn't it? I want to tell you that 11 men changed the world. It seems ambitious, but 11 Galileans then joined by another 109 change the world. The reason I'm ambitious is because I know the Holy Spirit. I saw him take down Rome. I saw him take down Germany in the Berlin Wall. I saw him take down Stalin. I saw Mussolini fall before the power of the Holy Spirit. I've seen the great empires fall. I've seen Christianity and the power of the Holy Spirit test time. I've seen armies in Red Square open Bibles in Russian and pray. I've seen. And because of what I've seen, I can have expectations. I don't have silver. I don't have gold. But what I have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus, take your city and walk. If you are not encouraged, inspired, and empowered to change your city, you have not understood Christianity. If you are not encouraged, inspired, and empowered to change your immediate environment, you have not understood Christianity. Because when the Holy Spirit comes, he gives you power. And so, this first miracle is telling you, I'm here to change every single thing. Disease, finances, social structures, people's walk, people's talk, people's expectation. I wonder if the church still believes in the power of the Holy Spirit. Pastor, Fr France. France is about to get shaken from the bottom up and from the top to the bottom. They're going to be polyvooing the Holy Spirit, that's what they're going to be soon. Ecuador is going to change. Honduras with the Mara Salvatrucha. Wait till the Holy Spirit gets done with the Mara Salvatrucha. OBT, John Young, the human traffic girls and young ladies on the, near the I-4. Wait till the church says we don't have gold. We don't have silver. But what we have, we give to you. Get up and the Holy Spirit is here. Mm. For whosoever will say, I, I want to be that catalytic agent. I want to be Peter and John in the hour of prayer. I don't want them just by the gate of beautiful. I want them inside the temple. Will you pray with me? These who transform the world have come here. It says Acts 17.6 of the invasion of the apostles to Thessaloniki. And why not Orlando? And why not Oviedo and Utuado? And why not Claremont and Kissimmee? And why not this nation and its young people? Millennials who are looking for something real. And why not elderly people who are cast to the margins by a society that pe thinks people can be thrown away? Why not Calvary City Church? Why not El Calvario? Why can't we be the Peter and John of the 21st century? Why not you? These are just humble Galileans. Why not you? Don't tell it. Don't let the devil tell you you can't do it. Why not you? 
if he did it with some lowly fisherman, he can use you. I'm just a housewife. I'm just a, a domestic husband. Who I'm just, no, there's no just. All you are is a potential for the Holy Spirit to change your city. If you hear me this morning and you say, Pastor, I want to embrace that Peter and John moment. Pastor Gabe, I, I, I want to help Calvario Church build that great city. But I need the tools of, I need the faith. If you say, Pastor, I stand with, with this house. And I stand with all the men and women across the city, in churches around the city and the nation. Who say enough is enough. Every generation must have his Pentecost. If you say, I, I volunteer today. I, all I know is yesterday I couldn't walk, but today I'm jumping. All I know is my, my marriage couldn't walk yesterday, but today it's jumping. If you say, Pastor, I, I volunteer this morning. The altar is waiting for you. I want to pray with you. College student, retiree, ordained minister, lay person person who came for the first time or the thousandth time if you say I, I want to volunteer I, I, I want a Peter and John moment in my life I wait for you in the altar come pray with me I want to be the ones who change the city come pray with me Unamuno would say if not now when if not you who hallelujah You stand with me, church, as we get ready to pray. Ah. Hey, in, in this in this anointing, I, I just want to say I know a bunch of you this week and next week are graduating from colleges with bachelors and masters and PhDs and associates. I want to say all that investment in you is because God wants to use it to change the world. I want to say congratulations. I want to congratulate your family for helping you get through it. I want to congratulate that support group that helped you with your college payments and in your late night assignments and staying up at night. I want to celebrate you because you're Daniel and you're Esther and you're Joseph. And God is going to lift up a mighty army of college graduates. Of, you know, and that doesn't mean God can't use other people. My dad has an eighth grade education, has planted over 16 churches. But I'm talking to a specific group today. I want to tell you, congratulations. And now, that's a big moment in your life that you graduate. I ask you to pray, God, what's next for me? Guide me. Don't rush into anything. Don't rush into decisions. Ask the Holy Spirit to guide you. What are you going to do with that education? What are you going to do with those talents? What are you going to do with those investments? Congratulations. I celebrate you. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for your, for your present. At first, sometimes we pray, oh, what God going to do next? At first, I want to thank God for what he did already. You made it. You finished. Hey, everybody stretch your hand forward this way. We're having a John and Peter moment. John and Peter, proof of the presence of God. God, we want manifest presence. Your presence is ubiquitous. It's always present. You're omnipresent. But we're talking about manifest presence, where you manifest transformation, healing, where you empower our men, our women, our children to change systems and structures, to heal, to restore God, lift up this church to build a great city with the power of your Holy Spirit. Lift up El Calvario and lift up churches across this city. Churches across cultures, across languages with the power of the Holy Spirit to tell the city, get up and walk. Give us wisdom. Give us strategy. Give us power to lift every lame part of the city. And I pray for every woman and man here 
I pray for every marriage and every single person, every young person and every elderly person. Change their walk. Change their expectation. Change their devotional life. Lift them to higher dimensions of glory. It's not that we need more of the Holy Spirit. It's that we need to be more open. The Holy Spirit has come in His fullness. It's not it's that, 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 that there's more of Him. He's a person. It's that we need to be more open. And in every dimension of your life, God is empowering you and anointing you. Say with me, I receive that power. Say with me, God, use me. God, use me. Use me to heal this city. Use me to heal families. Use me to transform generations. Use me because every city needs its Pentecost. In Jesus' name I receive it. Amen and amen and amen. The gospel is not only words, but Paul says that the gospel is power. to Christ, that question is settled. You are a son of God.